I really like the three way fight way describing. I don't know if that's something you personally um, endorse or that's part of your particular worldview, but that's included in the book as one of the first pieces is about this three way fight. Um, actually, could you define that? Would you mind defining that? Yeah, absolutely. So Matthew Lyons, um, who's well known because he he is an editor at the uh, the, the the website Three A Fight that publishes mm-hmm. sort of anti fascist theory uh, articles, commentary, interviews, that kind of thing. And um, he has opened the chapter in the book um, where he talks about three way fight. The, the idea of a three way fight is that we're engaged in sort of, uh, I guess, a revolutionary struggle might be the the way to frame it. That in a conflict in a country or worldwide, you have not just two parties, but you have at least three. And so on one side, you have sort of workers or marginalized people, which ostensibly is made up of the left, right? The left should be sort Mm -hmm. of representing that. Sometimes it's debatable how well it represents that, but that's the kind of idea. And then on the other side of that, you have people in power, a ruling class maybe, or uh, wealthy, 1%, however it's kind of framed, people Mm -hmm. disagree on that. But there's sort of like a a, a power base. And a lot of assumptions go into the idea that those are the two forces and they're kind of clashing with Mm -hmm. one another. A three-way fight analysis throws a kind of wrench in it and says there's actually another group of people here that doesn't exactly line up with either one of those. For one, they're often made up of the people which the left says they represent working class people, things like Mm -hmm. that. But they don't, they operate in the opposite of those, uh, of their interests, right? They're working against equality. If the left is basically a movement towards greater equality, this third party is going against that. And then they're also against the pure interests of capital, meaning that they have an interest in disputing certain existent structures of the status quo. Now, mm-hmm. you know, we might argue that they don't actually affect, they actually effectively defend capital, but that's mm-hmm. sort of part of how they they still imagine. And there's a lot of ways that I think people think of these power dynamics as more than just a bifurcation. They, you know, there might be multiple parties in this, but this three-way fight is sort of a way that people think about anti-fascism and understanding what the far right does. That the far right is this third party that's not synonymous with the state or the interests of the working class and has its own interests. And so if people are, for example, in a struggle for greater equality, they have to actually deal with the fact that there's a third party here that acts mm-hmm. as kind of a an enemy or an opposition that they're also going to have to deal with simultaneously to the larger systemic issues they're doing. So that's always going to have to be present. And I think that's an important framework for understanding the far right because the far right bases a lot of its sense of legitimacy on its presentation as challenging the status quo. You know, they're fighting yeah, yeah. for white workers or they're fighting against, you know, immigration that, that represses wages. However it is, they present themselves as that. This is a big time of what's happening in a lot of the anti-queer organizing that's taking place now. Now is that there's the framework that we're actually defending kids, we're defending yeah. working people, we're defending your values, your communities, the legitimacy of your livelihoods. And so that we have to be able to sort of dispel that myth that they actually are synonymous with what they present themselves to be and mm-hmm. that see them in the proper context. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for defining that because I think it does help clarify maybe the direction we can go in as far as... Um, yeah, what the far, what the far right is, what it really, the ideals that they're presenting, the ideas that they have, and how it actually is landing with, you know, people in everyday life that are experiencing real forms of struggle, right? I mean, things are tough out here. I mean, it's expensive as shit. So of course, people are going to find things like who do we blame, right? Um, for that, and of course, there's a lot of uh, a lot to say about that in and of itself. But I just wanted to bring up this thing, and and maybe it ties into what I'm trying to ask. But I just really wanted to bring it up. So this is like over a year ago, and I don't think I shared this with you, but I'm, I'm from a very rural area of southern Idaho. Um, Idaho itself is quite conservative, just like so many rural areas we call, you know, red state or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, lots of Trump support, things like this. Anyway, the town that I lived in for a long time, there was a parade. It, I don't think it, it might have been a Fourth of July parade. It might have been one of the other kind of parades that they have in that. It's a small town. Um, that they have every uh, every year, there were Proud Boys marching in this parade. They were given uh, approval. They had to, you know, receive some kind of approval from the city to do this. But they were there marching, you know, with all the other kind of old men club groups. You know what I mean? Like it was just there. Like the and I remember, club stuff. Yeah, yeah. So like, there was only a few of them. Maybe I don't know. It was a small group. Um, they were wearing the the polo uniform that they typically wear. I remember seeing one of those guys in a gas station one, you know, late at night when I was 
going to get like beer and cigarettes or something, you know, unhealthy like that. I bumped into them there and I was just like, it was a little jarring for me because, you know, you kind of think the Proud Boys are having street fights in Portland. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But there were Proud Boys in this tiny little town in rural Idaho and they were in the parade. And then there was the pictures that my friend sent me where Proud Boys were in this little bigger city. It was still small, relatively speaking, but bigger for the area. And they were apparently volunteering and bringing like food and other goods and donating it to like a local like thrift store or kind of food drive type situation. And I was just thinking about that because I think the ways in which groups like the Proud Boys, we know what they're implicated in. And they're doing this kind of community outreach. That's what it felt like to me. It was like community outreach, kind of legitimizing them among people. Like, hey, they're not just people storming the Capitol. They're also you know, donating canned foods and marching in the, the, you know, the, the parade that we have every year. So I, I think to me, what I wanted to ask was like, how do we counter that? Mm. How do communities, cause I don't think people in urban areas and I hate this divide because I think it's kind of arbitrary and superficial, but nonetheless seemingly exists between rural and urban areas uh, places like cities, obviously, versus small town America. Um, there is an actual divide, and I feel it, and I know it's there because I've been there. They don't know what's going on in rural areas, in cities sometimes. They don't know what the fuck's up <laughs> and, and how people are doing. Um, and seeing something like the Proud Boys again, which is, you know, again, we don't need to get into that, but I, I just I wanted to talk about that aspect of, of anti-fascist organizing on a community level in areas that are not in cities. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think the first thing is exactly what you said. They are a part of the community and they do community work. Like you said, they deliver camp food. Sometimes militias in particular do a lot of community service work. Yeah, what yeah. other people in left spaces might call mutual aid. They do a lot of it. Mm -hmm. There's a story I told, I think I told in my first book um, about the rural organizing project, which is a, a project. It's actually a, a really interesting history out here in Oregon. In the 1980s, there was this, uh, what was called the anti clan network of different organizations, sort of like civic organizations or nonprofits, different things, community groups that formed to kind of fight the clan. And um, one of them was the uh, Coalition for Human Dignity out here, which is really involved in fighting skinheads along with anti racist action and other groups. Um, you know, fighting um, Holocaust and events, different things for a long time. They have a really vibrant history. But one of the projects was the Rural Organizing Project, which became an autonomous project of its own. It has like, I think, I think about 55 or over 50 little local chapters in different parts around Oregon and like do kind of progressive -y things. But one of the things that they often do is respond to the far right. So for example, in a really rural place in Oregon, um, a militia had started to form and was recruiting people. Now, this is an area where like, you don't have high-speed internet probably don't have cell phone service. You don't get ambulance service. You really have some tough things happening, yeah. you know, and this is not un, unheard of around rural parts of the country. Um, yeah. And so they show up and say, well, we'll drive you to the hospital. You know, we'll come, you know, you can call us and we'll make sure that, you know, the elderly neighbors down the road get their medication and stuff like they do things, right? Those are mm -hmm. real services that they're providing. And so that becomes their organizing. At the same time, they're also pumping people full of conspiracy theories. There was all this stuff about, you know, how they uh, how they thought refugees were sneaking over the border and I don't know, bringing drugs or doing whatever. And they were like organizing these like armed patrols of the forest, you know, mm -hmm. um, so they're kind of they're bringing both of these at the same time. What the Rural Organizing Project did was they came in and they helped a bunch of people in the community just form a, a community center. They had like in the general store, they put a computer there, um, taught them how to make a newsletter, um, created a phone tree so people get to know the neighbors. And over time, eventually, one of the people that had brought in the militia basically put a statement saying, we don't need the militia anymore. Mm. Like we we that we have now accomplished what that was attractive about that. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the problems that's happening in all these urban spaces where mutual aid work happens is that they're just doing it so far away from the conditions of rural areas and they're unwilling to sort of deal with the difficult ways in which rural communities have to get along you know um i live in a city it's really easy for me to avoid people i don't like uh people yeah. i don't agree with right like yeah. there's a density of people i don't i can choose to avoid that but when i lived in a rural area my barometer for that changes really profoundly because these are the people you have. You kind of have mm -hmm. to do it. Um, I was interviewing for my book on anti-Semitism. I was interviewing um, a rabbi from Chabad Lubavitch, a, a Hasidic group. 
and he was talking about and he, you know i think he identifies as a socialist i don't think i'm stepping out to say that he identifies as a socialist but he was talking about talking to people in his community and a lot of them are you know descendants of people who escaped pogroms mm -hmm. and a lot of the pogroms in the people who are you know carrying the weapons called themselves revolutionaries you know whether or not they were nationalists or they were socialists in some cases whatever they were re this was revolution mm -hmm. so the term revolution is actually quite confusing and scary to a lot of these folks sure. um, and yeah. the left in general doesn't seem to care much about orthodox jews or their lifestyle or their rules this is really obvious during the pandemic when you know people just had a disregard for the fact that like these pandemic rules were really deeply affecting to Orthodox lives. You know, if you go to your synagogue literally every single day, then what does it mean for someone to tell you, no, now you can't and to not really care that that affects you. So like mm. the people felt really alienated, but yeah. the people do in those communities do know about mutual aid. They don't know that word, but they do it a lot. It's a mm. really significant part. And because they are sort of with the people they have, there's a different culture of dealing with people. There's not like the dismissal. They're saying, okay, I have to deal with this person. I'm going to have to find a pathway forward. I'm going to have to communicate. We're all going to be Jews at the end of this. We're all going to be in this shul together. We're going to be in this neighborhood together, whatever it is. And I think there's a certain element of that in rural areas where people are used to that kind of work. You know, if you grew up in a farming community, you are used a little more frequently to helping a farmer who's about to lose his property do some of the work that needs to be done. And like maybe their equipment broke, maybe they lost money, they need help. That's a mm -hmm. more common thing. And those are people that might be Trump voters, right? They might con think, conceive of themselves in all kinds of ways, but they are more used to doing that than a lot of these sort of like what come across as really entitled urban liberals in a lot of cases that have no connection to doing that, that don't feel bonded communities in that way. And so I think it's it's worthwhile to take rural areas seriously because that's where a serious part of far-right growth is happening, right? To take their needs seriously and take these people seriously to care about it. Yeah. Um, because what you're going, what the best solution to confronting the far-right is, obviously defense and stuff is important, but going after those underlying conditions, why is it that rural areas are shifting to far-right politics at such a rapid rate? Well, it's the same thing that's happening in a lot of places, right? Falling wages, you know, falling property values, people are losing their farms. It's a tough area. And there's no social movement there working with them. They're kind of abandoned. Mm -hmm. So I think looking at that as an opportunity to grow with a community, to take those people seriously, um, to take what they do already seriously, to take their work seriously and their sense of community and sense of value seriously, that's all really, really necessary. And you're not going to really confront that, that self-presentation and branding that the Proud Boys are doing unless you take up that mission themselves, unless you become a part of that community and you actually want to care for folks and you do it in a sincere way that reflects their dignity, it's just simply not going to work. Yeah. Yeah. It was just, uh, I think that any sort of leftist revolutionary project, and this seems so obvious, but it doesn't feel that way sometimes. Um, there has to be, you have to kind of confront the ways in which whatever sort of late capitalist hellscape we're in, where rural and uh rural and urban is seen as this divide there's such a and there is truly a gap but i again people exist in both contexts i've been in both contexts i know that there's a difference in how you live and based on these things so i yeah i would just say you know absolutely because i where i'm getting the strongest dose of fascism is in these little rural communities because it's not just Trump flags I'm seeing. I see a lot of militia shit. I see like a lot of things that really indicate a, a real um, distrust of authority. But it's it's a very specific kind of distrust because obviously they love the police. It's kind of a contradiction in some ways. But, you know, it's about um, asserting authority in a very different kind of way. So I, I get that that feeling from just my neighbors living out there. You know, I'm like, I feel that. Like it, it's very very tangible. So, um, yeah, I think any sort of leftist organizing, and I'm not speaking as someone who's done this myself, but I do think there has to be some way in which inroads, if they aren't already being done, can be made into these communities because, yeah, militias and the far right are on some level, in some way, uh, their influence is felt there. And that, that just, I don't know, I just had to really kind of speak to that. 
you know, you had Spencer Sunshine on here uh, a while back, and you know, yeah. he made a comment once that always stuck with me, which is that the far right doesn't critique the left; it is the critique of the left. Mm. Uh, mm-hmm. It presents itself as the sort of antithesis to the failures of the left, where the left was failed to live up to its promise for a lot of people. Yeah, and I mean, the left is, uh, you know, as a, as an organized force is uh, is sort of best known for losing more than winning. Um, and the right then offers itself as the alternative to that. So if the left fails to, you know, really th- push back on the decline of unions and of uh, um, uh, resources for living and real wages, things like that, the right's going to come in with an answer and say it's because they didn't focus on the real problem, which is immigrants driving down wages, mm-hmm. um, or these parasitic banker class, this cabal that's manipulating everything. So I think we have to think about how we undo the conditions at its fundamental core. And that's the real, I think, in in the end, that is the fundamental story. Anti-fascism, in a lot of ways, is the stopgap along the way. It's what you do to protect communities while you should be working on these fundamental issues, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it's not a replacement for a union organizing or tenant organizing, right? Those are essential. But it is necessary to keep those safe, to keep the community safe while it's happening, to um, to stop the encroachment that both is a threat of violence to people, it's real violence, but it's also a threat of capturing that radical energy that people are feeling.